Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, interesting seeing things with, when, you're, when you're slightly handicapped. Um, I'm speaking as a geophysicist, not something. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, deep water seismic nodes and exactly how we're using them to try to minimize uh, risk in deep water drilling. So the uh, outline of the talk is here, a little bit of an introduction, uh, description of the technology and how it's been applied uh, over the last, uh, well, actually the first commercial use was almost 10 years ago in full field sense. Uh, and then some recent developments, which are quite interesting uh, from a production standpoint, uh, using it in sort of semi-real-time applications, and then some potential future use and some conclusions. So the actual technology uh, developed, these are uh, autonomous seismic recording units. They're battery-powered, lithium-ion rechargeable batteries, as it happens. They're battery-powered, four-component sensors, flash memory, uh, they weigh about 100 kilos, about the same as I do. So we deploy them using ROVs, as shown in the cartoon here. And uh, typically, uh, say the water depths you'll see, we've been down to about uh, just below 3,000 meters, 2,900 meters. They're typically deployed in a sparse receiver geometry. Uh, so it's very different to the towed streamer, which is kind of receiver-rich, shop-poor, we're the opposite way around, so we put the, the receivers down, typically three or 400 meter grid, and then a carpet of shots, and going out, because obviously you've got decoupled sources and receivers, you can get any offset you want. So most of the work we've done has been with eight to 10 kilometer offsets, but there's increasing demand to push that. In fact, we're actually looking at doubling that in some instances to use uh, full waveform inversion. And obviously, because you've got decoupled shots and receivers, you can get full azimuth rather than the MTO, more than one uh, azimuth that you get from most of the towed streamer geometries. And as I say, you can get any uh, offset you like. So it, it has become, certainly for one particular oil company, the technology of choice for imaging below complex salt bodies in the deep water Gulf of Mexico, which is where most of the work we've done has been focused. So here's just a, a snapshot of where we've been working. As you can see, most of the work we've done has been for Shell and uh, their partners, and then some uh, different uh, uh, one or two other companies have actually bitten the bullet and uh, gone ahead. So that, it's, uh, it's been predominantly Shell who've been uh, driving this use. And basically, all of their deep water production in the Gulf of Mexico, they've acquired full azimuth data, both 3D and 4D, as I'll describe. So we get superior imaging uh, from the full azimuth data. It's actually quite a quiet environment, putting the nodes on the seafloor, especially in deep water away from any current activity. And you don't get the, the noise you get with the towed streamer due to weather or steering the streamers, uh, even with the multi-component streamers that you see some noise on. As I say, we get full azimuth long offset, and we get mirror migration. We're able to use uh, the downgoing energy uh, to actually image the data. We're essentially imaging the sea surface multiple because that gives us better near offset coverage in the near <coughs> surface to try and compensate for the uh, sparse receiver geometries we're using. So on the right-hand side of the slide is a, a comparison from a, a shell paper from six years ago now uh, comparing a narrow azimuth towed streamer, that's what NATS is, for those of you who don't know, compared with OBN, ocean bottom nodes, on the bottom. And you've got much better definition uh, shown in this 2D slice taken from the, the abstract from the paper uh, from the OBN data and uh, as confirmed by drilling results, et cetera, et cetera. So the superior imaging uh, is what drives people towards it. And the fact that you know people have seen the huge improvement in uh, imaging around complex structures from towed streamer data where you go to uh, wide azimuth because it's not completely full, although some of the circle shoots and, uh, do give it, and, and maybe some of the, the multi-azimuth gives you uh, an uneven distribution of offsets but covers through, through the offsets. You get really superb improvement as you go to improving the azimuth distribution. Uh, and the problem is that in producing fields, you can't take these fairly complex six, eight, ten vessel configurations uh, or the circle shooting uh, or the forward and reverse shooting that people do, you can't take them through the producing facilities. It just doesn't work because obviously there's kit in the way. So uh, 
uh, we've moved forward to, to put placing the sensors on the sea floor, uh, so using the ROVs. And what's interesting is that if you're careful, and obviously you have to work in very close cooperation with the OIMs uh, on these facilities because they're, you know, they're very expensive facilities. Uh, they don't want to interrupt it by you know, the, the poor relation seismic. We can, in most cases, actually continue, get continuous receiver coverage in spite of the obstructions and in spite of the usually 500 meter exclusion zone for the ROV handling vessel because the ROVs are able to fly inside the uh, exclusion zone. We don't fly under risers or anchor cables, you know, those are glass walls, but we can typically get uh, continuity of receiver coverage th around the obstructions and uh, then we have a small shot hole because the, uh, the shot vessel, shooting vessel, is usually allowed to get closer to the uh, obstructions than the, uh, uh, the node handling vessel. And so you end up with much better continuity of coverage around, around the receiver and hence you get better images where you have the actual, uh, usually with vertical or semi-vertical wells, um, the most information that you need. So it's the combination of the sparse receiver grid and remember, when we put these receivers out, um, I say it's typically three or 400 meters between each one, each one of those then records about a quarter of a million shots. And so you end up having a uh, common rec a receiver gather, and you look on each node that's got a quarter of a million shots going into it, and we invoke reciprocity and say, well, that's like having a quarter of a million channel recording system with a shot in the middle of it and we 3D, 3D shot migrate the common receiver gather using a quarter of a million shots in full azimuth, and that's why you get such great data. So, I told this. So that's why we get such, there we go. There was a hook of the lead in there. Uh, this is taken from uh, one of the papers Shell gave uh, in 2011 at the EAGE, showing uh, a 4D on the <coughs> DEMOS field uh, where they showed 6% NRMS. And that is comparable with the kind of NRMS is normal, normalized root mean square. It's a measure of the repeatability of the 4D signal uh, from the baseline to the monitor survey. Uh, if it was zero, everything would be perfectly repeatable. Toad streamers typically struggles to get, especially in the Gulf of Mexico where you've got currents and different feathering, struggles to get below 20, 25 percent. The permanent systems that BP have used and published the information out, they get around 4 or 5% NRMS. So we're doing very well. It means that the experiment, both the baseline and the monitor survey, have been executed uh, extremely well to get that kind of repeatability. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why it's being used uh, across all shells facilities or deep water produ producers in the Gulf of Mexico. So the actual technology, just going back to it for a second, as I say, we operates down to 3,000 meters. It's a uh, dual, dual housed, I mean, dual sort of cavity pressure housing. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, pretty large, weighs almost 100 kilos. We have recently introduced uh, what are called CSACs, which turns out to be chip scale atomic clocks. When I was a student in the, the last millennium, an atomic clock was... Uh, about the size of, I don't know, this uh, podium area. Uh, and we had one in, in the university and it was sort of, you had to be uh, you know, touched by God to be allowed to go near it. Um, you can now get them, they're just about the size of a credit card, as you can see the, the, at the bottom of the picture, that's a dime. So, and uh, that has uh, much better uh, stability in terms of its, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we put the, the, the nodes on the seafloor and so we don't have any communication with GPS because they're completely standalone. So we have, we have no idea of time because every other seismic recording system you see uses GPS time. And so we uh, used to use a double oven crystal oscillator and that was very power hungry because we had to keep the, the oscillator at a constant basically tuning fork at constant temperature. We put these CSAC clocks in and we get, uh, with some new electronics, we get about 200 day battery life compared with the 60 days we had before. And uh, there are some interesting ramifications of putting in this much more stable clock, which I'll talk about later. So it's got three component fixed axis phones, and to be 10 hertz phones, especially ma spectrally matched hydrophone. And uh, as I say, everything's recorded on flash memory. 
it's deployed. And typically, it's about 75 days we're, we're on the seafloor, uh, as you'll see later on the, the service we've shot. The data, the node is recovered. So it's deployed using an ROV. And the ROV brings the node back to the surface. We unload the data, resynchronize to GPS, because there has been some a little bit of drift, even with the CSAT clocks. And then uh, the data is then taken on for reformatting and then on to processing on shore. So the, the cartoon here shows, uh, slightly different from the one I showed earlier, so you've got the sparse receiver grid on the seafloor, the ROV putting the nodes out. We typically put out, using dual ROVs, we're typically laying out about 70 nodes per day. So, and you'll see on average we're using about 1,100 nodes for each of the surveys we've done. So it takes a little while to get the full spread out. But what we do is we put sufficient nodes down and it takes four or five days uh, to allow us to start shooting into them because we're shooting typically eight to 10 kilometers off the receiver area because we want eight to 10 or even more uh, kilometers of offset. And so we can start shooting while we're still laying the nodes down. We continue uh, until the nodes are all laid out. So if we've got 1,400 nodes and doing 70 a day, it takes 20 days to lay out the full spread. But we can start shooting after five or four or five, maybe six days, depending on the geometry. And we then shoot across. And typically, we're shooting for about 60 days or so. And then we pick the nodes up and recover the data. So the, uh, uh, there's no navigation on the nodes themselves. The ROVs are usually operating in an acoustic network that's associated with the field. If not, we put our own acoustic network down. Uh, we've just upgraded the vessel that we're using to 2,200 nodes. It used to have 1,500, but uh, we're just about to start a major project. It's on, it's on the slide. We're just, just mobilizing for it that requires uh, the increased number of nodes to remove any duplicate shots. And uh, so we use a, a dual source shooting vessel to achieve the 50 meter shot grid. So just a, that's the technology that drives this. And so here's the, uh, the actual pictures. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner is the shooting boat. It's been around in the industry for quite some time until we bought it uh, two years ago. And then the uh, DP2, Dynamic Positioning 2, node handling vessel shown in the top left-hand corner. Uh, the, all the uh, equipment, let's see, all this here, is, was actually installed. That's the, the, the ROVs, cranes are up here. And then we have a high speed loader on the tail here. And these are heave compensated. And all of this we put on uh, the, the oil field supply vessel, the DP2 vessel. And it's a working class ROV. Uh, this the umbilical, the tether management system that sits a couple of hundred meters above the ROV. The ROV is here. Underneath, we've got a sled. It, the ROV takes 12 nodes down with it. And, and we use the high-speed loader to take 20, 24 nodes down to keep the ROVs, because there are two of them, one port, one starboard, um, to uh, keep the ROV working close to the seabed. Because most of the sort of wear and tear occurs on the ROV side when you lift it out the water to get it back on deck. So we try to keep the, the ROVs in the water and uh, to, to deploy the nodes on the seafloor. And then this is a picture taken from the very first survey that was done for BP on the Atlantis field. This is a picture from the ROV showing the node actually placed on the seafloor, and this is part of the ROV, this part of this picture you see. And this is the, the sticky foot that's used to place the ROV. And we kind of push it in to the silt or whatever. And it, because it's a fixed axis geophone, we have to keep it to within nominally five degrees of vertical. If you look at the headers, because we've got tilt and azimuth sensors inside the nodes when we look at the data back on board, typically it's about half to one degree. And, and we orient them in a particular orientation, and, and the ROV operator knows this, and we try to orient them all the same so we have a consistency on the sea floor. So this is the summary of, of the work done so far. We've done 25 surveys uh, so far. There's a couple of test programs in Norway and out in Brunei. All the rest has been in the Gulf of Mexico. On average, the uh, survey is about 175 square kilometers of the receiver area. Uh, we typically use just under 1,200 nodes to, to re record that. The average shots, I should say, a quarter of a million. It's getting close to 300,000 as we push the offsets up. 
Uh, and on average for these surveys, it takes 76 days to acquire the survey. I mean, generally, we get about 3,750, between 3,500 and 4,000 shots per day to achieve this. And I say almost all this work has been for Shell in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's a, it's a pretty impressive backlog. It's been working continuously uh, for the last uh, four years doing this. So I say this is just a, that <laughs> slide of the uh, aerial distribution in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's 22 large scale and three what are called I4D, instantaneous 4D. And I'll explain why that, that is a Shell terminology. Surprise, surprise. Um, we've done three of those, and I'll sh show you how we did that. Uh, we've had more than 98% data recovery. The nodes are extremely reliable. Um, we don't open them up in the, in the field. If anything goes wrong, they come back to the factory just outside Houston, Texas. And we manufacture everything that goes into the node apart from the batteries and the hydrophones themselves, the, the sensors themselves. We burn our own, we make our own PC boards. We've got a couple of million dollar PC uh, board makers and all the investment groups say, well, that's crazy, you need to farm out, you can do it for half the price. Yeah, but if it fails, then we don't know until 75 days later. So we try to make sure everything is screened. We, we ask the component manufacturers to pre-screen the resistors and capacitors that go on the boards, and we reject 30% of the pre-screened ones. So, uh, in total, we've had uh, over 27,500 nodes deployed and recovered. We haven't lost any. And just over 5.5 million shot points have gone into that. And we've gone from 200 meters down to 2,900 meters. So, uh, so I mentioned I4D, so this recent development in the last couple of years, instantaneous 4D. And so what we've done is shrunk down the, the, the survey, if you like. So we've gone out with a single vessel rather than the dual vessel, node handler and shooting vessel, gone out with a single vessel with a working class ROV and a node handler. And about, you'll see, we, we provisioned for 450 nodes. We didn't actually use as many as that. Um, and everything's been containerized, so we can put on and off. Uh, it has interesting uh, repercussions or potential for vessels of opportunity to do uh, undershoots, so-called node undershoots. In fact, there's a tender out in Brazil right now. The all the streamer companies have been told they have to get nodes to do node undershoots to get better coverage in the near offset. Um, and we have the complete navigation system that we use as well. So this is the, this is the vessel we used for this I4D. Uh, and we rigged up uh, the back deck of the vessel with a source and, uh, I said, these containers. So we have the, uh, the nodes put into containers in storage. We can put 150 of these nodes in a 20 foot, standard 20-foot container. And then we have a, a charging and operating. So we put 100 nodes, 50 this side, 50 this side, and then an operator can come down and connect it up. We've got the charging and data uh, management systems, data unloading, GPS synchronization, etc., all in here. And so we, we, we put two of these together, and then it goes on board the boat. And so we've got two of these, and then a utility room, and then an instrument room here in a 16 foot by 40 foot footprint. So we just drop it onto the back deck of the vessel and basically weld it in place. And then we've got a, uh, so we use four containers for this particular one. And so we actually looked at scaling it up. And this vessel could actually have 1,100 nodes on that if we wanted to. But for this I4D application, uh, we don't need that many. And then we have containerized compressors. And so this is uh, two 600 uh, CFM LMF compressors inside a container, uh, electrical drive. So you just plug it in. I mean, it takes a lot of current, but you just plug it in. And for this particular compressor configuration was capable of generating or sustaining uh, just under 3,000 cubic inches, which was sufficient for the projects in mind. And uh, then we have uh, what somebody referred to as an IKEA source. It's actually a flat pack source. This actually, you can unbolt this and it flips sideways. And so it's e easily shipped right around the world, although we just were using it in the Gulf of Mexico. And so it's a, a, th a three string array. Uh, in this flat pack source, and we put this on the back deck of the vessel. So you had a hybrid vessel with a couple of hundred nodes and a source and compressors. And we went out, and the, the intent is that you reoccupy the receiver locations, and the node locations that you had when you went out and did the big full-scale survey. So you go back in, and in some cases we actually see three or four years later, 
the footprint of where we just push the node in very gently because it's a very stable environment. Sometimes, it depends where you are. Uh, so we see the uh, reoccupy the node locations, uh, again, with the 400 meter spacing. And so this particular one, uh, I think we had uh, 96 for, for, for this one. And then we do a 50 meter shot grid over a limited part, and obviously asymmetric because most of the dips are this way. And, and you know, we've, we've already, or Shell had already acquired 3D data in the area, so they know the structure very well. They know where the, where the image rays are, so they can actually have intelligent shot point location, binning on subsurface, people used to call it. But anyway, so we end up with a 90-fold uh, data set. Uh, and this is taken from a Shell paper that was given in Beijing last year. So the I-40, you've got the red dots, or you go back in and reoccupy, and then you shoot around <coughs> this area. And uh, what was interesting in the Shell paper they were actually able to detect, round an injector, they were able to detect uh, reservoir changes uh, in 56 days after the injection. So most of the 40 effects people see are in number of years, but they put these round individual uh, injector locations. And the feedback from Shell has been this is very, very successful, and they want to try and make this lower cost and there's a way we can maybe be able to do that, which I'll come to in a second, because they'd like to do it around all water injectors if we can get it down to a low enough cost. Sounds familiar. Um, so uh, anyway, it's uh, an interesting development, and I say it re relies on the fact we've got a baseline, and we've got baseline receiver locations, and we've got a very good knowledge of the velocity field because we've already imaged the data once with our 3D, so we can get an instantaneous 4D very, very quickly, and typically, these can be generated within a month or two of the acquisition. So they're able to see changes in the reservoir in a much shorter time frame than people have generally looked at before. So I mentioned the node undershooting. It's been done once so far in Angola, as it happens. We didn't do it. One of our competitors did it. But the idea is you, you have a hole in coverage around your pro producing facilities, and similar to the one I showed before. So when you, when you try to shoot the toad streamers, you end up with a, a one, one and a half kilometer wide, eight to 10 kilometer kind of lozenge shape where you lack the near offset coverage. And the idea is you go in and you populate that with nodes. And then when you look at the modeling, you can't just use the streamer shots because you still lack the near offsets. And you go in with a dedicated, in this case, a dedicated source vessel to actually get better near offset coverage. And I say there's a tender out right now in Brazil with three node undershoots specified, and the toe streamer contractors have to find node undershoot capability. And there's only two companies that offer it. So it'd be interesting. Uh, but yeah, this, this is something that is, is, in certain areas of the world, could have significant impact on the data quality for reservoir management, especially in the 4D sense, close to the actual producing facilities themselves. So future use. Um, one of the things that uh, we used to do when we had double oven crystal oscillators was not turn the nodes off. There was no on-off switch. You get them up to temperature to keep the oscillator in a quasi-linear region of its drift curve, and you want to keep it at that temperature no matter what the temperature is outside or what the temperature is on the seafloor because you want it stable, and you don't want to turn it off because if you turn it off and it's off for 10 days, it takes eight or nine days to come back up to temperature. So you don't want to do that. So we, knew, we had no on-off switches, and we never turned the nodes off. Where they were manufactured, we turned them on, we test them, and then they stayed on. They never went off, because um, we didn't want to take the oscillators out of their comfort zone. The CSACs, you can turn on and off. They don't require a stable temperature. And so what we thought about, and what we're looking at, is the fact that you could put the node down turn it on remotely, and you can use acoustics to do that, and then record data, and then turn it off and leave it on the seabed. And what we're looking at is how we actually extract data from the node whilst it's in situ on the seafloor. And we're talking about a lot of data. So we're actually uh, investigating and uh, the use of, excuse me, the use of what we call uh, Z-LOFs, Z-Life of Field, uh, semi-permanent type application. So we deploy the nodes off in a, in a grid. 
when the shooting vessel is ready, we turn them on, synchronize to GPS, check the status of the nodes, and then we record data into them, turn them off, and then hoover data out of them. And that's the tricky part, whilst they're still there. And the battery life with these uh, rechargeables is 200 days. So if you, we reckon the engineering group say they can put these to last five years on the seafloor, and we could do 10 20-day surveys. Uh, and that corresponds, we just lost the bonnet there, but it's about 90,000 shots for, in 10 days. And uh, 20 days, sorry. And that's, you can get 225 square kilometers shot area. So you can actually image quite a lot of the, the, if you go for what we call blended source, shooting more than one source at a time, and we've done a lot of work on that, quite a lot of expertise. It doesn't appear to harm 3D data, 4D, we'll have to see how we can do that. Um, you could actually get much, much better fold or much larger area because you can turn the uh, uh, nodes on and off. Uh, the trick is to extract the data. And I say, I think it's 1.4 uh, terabytes per node for each snapshot. So if you put 200 nodes out, you've got 280 terabytes to extract. So it's quite a lot of data. Uh, but we're working on it. So I say we deploy them off. Uh, we remotely switch them on, uh, check the health of the node, synchronize it to GPS, and then we undertake whatever the shot program is, turn them off, uh, extract the data. I say, yeah, it's in here. So it's 1.4 terabytes per node for a 20-day snapshot. And we're currently evaluating the technology to allow us to extract this data. So uh, it's got greatly reduced installation costs. People, I mean, most of the reason why everybody doesn't do permanent systems, because you've seen the Valhalla results with the 20 to 1 return on investment, uh, is that it costs a lot of money up front. So the, the nodes, because they're sparse receiver, because they're using ROVs, you're not trenching them in, you have to worry about cables. Uh, we're pretty sure about the lifetime of the nodes. Uh, if the node fails, it's quite easy to replace it. If, he heaven forfend, there's a change in the development plan, which of course never happens, you can actually move them out of the way quite easily. Or if there's a change in the subsurface drainage and you suddenly find that that isolated pocket has actually got connectivity somewhere and you want to have a different part of the seismic image, it's very easy to move it. So we think this may have, this flexibility may allow us to uh, eat into the uh, PRM market, the permanent reservoir monitoring market, by going for a semi-permanent solution. Uh, if we remove the rechargeables today and put regular batteries in, we'd actually have 400-day battery life, but we're, we're working on that. So uh, it's got no need to plow it in. It's got reduced environmental impact. You can move it around very easily. The OIM's quite happy with it because it's an ROV deployed thing. And we know we get excellent repeatabil repeatability. Uh, so we think it's very, very viable for 4D going forward. So, in conclusion, ocean bottom nodes have shown themselves to be very robust and efficient at acquiring very high quality full azimuth long offset 3D and 4D data. By, how, by using the scalability of the nodes, we can actually get I4D, very monitor very rapid changes in the reservoir uh, in a cost efficient fashion. Uh, these hybrid vessels we talked about that we use for the I4D have the potential to do node undershooting very efficiently as well. And the introduction of these uh, CSAC clocks and the potential, and we haven't proved it yet, the potential to extract the data using high-speed underwater communications might allow us to uh, provide a, a semi-permanent alternative to the cable-based PRM systems. And I'd like to thank you for that and invite questions. Yeah, please. Um, thank you. My name is Jude. I'm nice presentation. I just want to ask the I4D you mentioned within this period of time you said, which seems to be very short, how you show the 4D effect is as a result of fluid movement and not pressure? Um, I'd have to refer you to the shell paper was presented. I, I can, if you talk to me afterwards, I can send you. Can we, I can send you uh, the details of the the paper where they pr they presented. 
where they go in for that particular reservoir, how they were able to uh, measure the uh, impact of the water injector so quickly. Okay. Um, secondly, in turbodyne the environment, deep water, channels, sands development are basically moving from the very thick ones to the thinner ones less than 10 meters. How is this technology able to resolve the thinner beds laterally continuous but very thin in terms of if you do an inversion, how are you able to see your net sand distribution along the field in places of very less well control? Um, Mother Earth is very unkind in attenuating higher frequencies that are needed for uh, good uh, vertical resolution. Uh, one of the things that uh, allows the seismic 3D technique to work so well is the, the spatial continuity and the fact that we get good uh, definition of uh, spatial discontinuities. And so you obviously have to look at the particular challenges and whether or not the frequencies are actually recoverable. Um, but because you have full azimuth data, you're able to get better resolution if you can get the right velocity model. And it's not easy, but you can get better resolution. And we've, we've seen this in the, the, the work that's been done with the toad streamers. You get this dramatic improvement in imaging capability as you go to wider and wider azimuths. And so uh, if you can't do it with full azimuth data, then you're never going to see it. So I'm not saying this is a, a magic bullet, but it's going to give you the best chance you have. If you have a, a very, very thin sand, and you're down at you know, 3,000 meters below the seabed, it's going to be a challenge to see it because the frequencies aren't going to be there. So you know, it, it will depend. But the full azimuth solution will provide better bandwidth than the, uh, uh, I call them MTO, more than one azimuth geometries. OK. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, Nam Daniel DK, Energy Consultant. Um, you promised to say something about costs. Are you able to put any numbers on sort um, of? <laughs> we think, and I say it's, it's not proven yet, we think that the, uh, for the semi-permanent solution, we should be able to deliver the, uh, the data for somewhere between 20 and 30% of the current permanent reservoir monitoring solutions. All right. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, Chris, can you just say a little bit about the frequency range of the uh, sensors that you put into the nodes uh, and how low a frequency you can uh, attain? Yeah, yeah the, 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 there's nothing magic about the sensors we're currently using uh, because we're battery powered, we like to use non-active sensors. So there's no accelerometers or powered devices. We're using geophones. Uh, in the Z3000 system, we have a 10 hertz geophone. So people say, OK, well, you know, you've got 12, 12 dB per octave roll off. So, you know, um, I would just draw people's attention to the fact that geophones have very low noise floors. And as people go to lower and lower frequencies for things like full waveform inversion, um, accelerometers and active sensors uh, have a one over F noise problem. So if you look at the noise at three or four hertz, which is about the lowest energy coming out of an air gun array, you'll find that MEMS devices have significantly higher noise levels than the roll-off noise floor of the geophone. And there's a, there's a 15 hertz geophone, an omnidirectional geophone, that we use in our shallow water node on a rope system. And we were actually disbarred from bidding on some work in the Norwegian sector, as it happened, um, because we didn't have a MEMS device. And I asked why. And they said, well, we want better low frequencies. And I pointed them to a paper by uh, one of Dave's former colleagues who had looked at microseismic data on Valhal, which happens to have in the permanent system BP have on Valhal, has exactly the same 15 hertz geophone. And that microseismic data had 0.1 hertz detectable signal in it, which you would never see on a MEMS device. And they went, ah, oh, you need to go and see our research people. But so, so it's, it's a 10 hertz geophone. 
and it's a roll-off. But, but all the work we're doing is very low frequency. And so we've been... Geophones aren't very sexy. So we've been looking at alternative devices. I think we've tested eight or nine different devices out in the... Uh, there's a very... The quietest place in the world, apparently, is in, in a cave near Albuquerque. And the, the, the U.S. Department of Defense built. And so you can go and rent it for the day and test your sensors. We've only found one sensor, actually two sensors now, that match the performance of the geophone. Um, and we're looking at putting those into the field to see. The, the only challenge is that the, the one that one matches the performance of the geophone, so why would you change it? And people say, well, because yeah, you can't use geophones because they're, they're old. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the one that's better than the geophone, it's very sexy, it's very clever, um, but it's $5,000 a unit in mass-produced quantities. And so we'll, we'll test it and see, but it would, it would significantly increase the operating costs for us for a very marginal benefit. Well, we could say we've got a digital sensor. But anyway, long answer, sorry. Very good. I think we ought to allow you to sit down. Okay, no yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> I and, shut up. And, and, and don't walk too far, I would say. Okay. Um,